Good morning, everyone. Um, very honored to be here today and grateful to colleagues at uh, FIIA and at the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs for uh, all of their support and interest in our work. I'll try to set the scene a little bit about the topic that we're going to be addressing today. And I'd like to take a step back and say that in general, people in my field of Russia experts all need to be a lot more humble and a lot less overconfident about what we do and don't know. And there's, I think, a tendency in the field for everyone to say, you know, I, I saw this coming. You know, the reality is very few of us would have ever thought that an undistinguished mid-level Russian intelligence operative uh, would basically come out of nowhere to be seen as one of the world's most powerful, uh, wealthiest, and influential figures. No one would have predicted the huge transformation of Russia and the accumulation of wealth over the last 25 years. Uh, none of us predicted the revolution of dignity in Ukraine, the seizure of Crimea, the uh, successful military in intervention in Syria, the involvement in the U.S. presidential election of 2016. So I think a lot, you could go down with a list, a long list of things that were either not anticipated or not properly understood at the time. I can remember very clearly descriptions of how Russia was going to throw itself into a military quagmire in Syria, clearly. Uh, these sort of comments, um, which are putting aspiration over reality, force people in our field, I think, to accept a degree of, of humility and uh, lack of confidence about our ability to predict events going forward. Um, the project that we're here to talk to you about today has been central to our team's work for the last two plus years, which uh, it's a project entitled The Return of Global Russia. And what we've tried to do is create an analytical framework in an unemotional, non-sensationalist way to explain this pattern of Russian foreign policy activism in regions that are far from Russia's immediate territory, sort of beyond the immediate backyard and neighborhood where Russia's influence uh, is greatest, and to try to understand what it is and to see what the drivers are, to see what the constituencies are inside of Russia, and then to see what the external factors are that kind of accelerate and drive a lot of this activity. Um, in general, and I'm, you know, again, engaged in a fair amount of self-criticism here, I'm not saying this uh, happily, there is a tendency to portray Russia as three meters tall and great strategic actor um, and to kind of over-exaggerate at times Russian capabilities and intentions. That's not to say it's not a dangerous situation or that Russia hasn't engaged in horrible conduct, particularly since the invasion of Ukraine in 2014, but it requires us, I think, to step back a little bit and rack and stack, to use an American term, what we really care about, where Russian activity is noise or potentially value destructing. So for example, if Russia wants to plow endless resources into strategically non-essential parts of Africa, like the Central African Republic, it's tragic and horrible what's happening there, but it definitely is potentially of a lesser priority than Russian activity in other parts of the world. Um, much of this activity is on the cheap, so it's sustainable. Much of this activity is to fill vacuums, many of which were created uh, in the previous U.S. administration, but have now accelerated and grown and expanded under President Trump. So Russia has, as our president at Carnegie, Bill Burns, likes to say, a target-rich environment. So there are plenty of opportunities around the world for Russia to, with relatively small amounts of uh, investment, create an image that it is a force to be reckoned with. And then once Russia has inserted itself into these situations most vividly right now, I think in Libya, where events are moving rather quickly, um, this becomes a challenge for Western uh, policy practitioners to try to manage around a Russia which has dealt itself into a problem. And once it's dealt in, it's really hard to dislodge. Um, I'll be really quick and summarize the portion of a forthcoming paper that I'm here to talk about specifically, which looks at basically how Russia has tried to put uh, its approach to multilateral institutions within this broader uh, lens of global activism. And so the paper, which was written by two former State Department colleagues, uh, Paul Stronsky and Richard Sokolsky, um, tries to take a look at how the Primakov Doctrine, which in many ways is much more important in guiding Russian foreign policy currently than the other doctrine, which everyone loves to talk about, the Gerasimov Doctrine, is the driver of much of Russia's external foreign policy behavior right now and over the past arguably 20 plus years. And that's a vision of a multipolar world where 
the United States no longer gets to call most of the shots and all of our loyal uh, subordinate powers in the Russian view um, sort of play along according to U.S. diktat. So anything that Russia can do to establish itself as an alternative pole with dominance in uh, the former Soviet space and that chips away at that U.S.-led international order is, uh, is to be uh, is to be pursued. In the case of multilateralism, what we've seen is uh, that Russia has, since 2014, when it became more isolated and became the subject of so much intense criticism over its behavior in Ukraine, has sought to step up its engagement with a variety of multilateral institutions where the West is not present. So the paper looks at, with particular focus, Russian activities inside the Eurasian Union, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the BRICS. And it tries to make a broad argument, which is that as with a lot of Russian foreign policy, the pageantry and symbolism of Russia's activities, particularly at the head of state level, matters far more than outcomes. And so if you start to dig down, and as much as, you know, for example, uh, there was a lot of concern in the first phase of Russia's push for more integration and the creation of a customs union and then the Eurasian uh, Economic Union. There was a focus on whether Russia was trying to re-Sovietize the region and re-dominate, uh, re -dominate, if that's a word, I guess it's not a word, dominate once again its neighbors. The question is, have these institutions successfully provided a platform for Russia to do that? And what we see in our research is that the pattern of Russian behavior is decidedly mixed and that for a whole host of reasons, and the paper goes into this in quite a lot of detail, if you look, for example, at the Eurasian Union, a lot of what Russia has talked about doing, and where Russia obviously has a huge amount of sway in the direction of the Eurasian Union, is fervently resisted and contested by other member states. So in some ways, their agenda is to use this institution to constrain and contain Russian influence. It's not about basically negotiating the terms of their surrender. And you see this where also Russia itself has refused to hand over certain amounts of its own sovereignty to these supranational organizations. And so the, the EAEU remains largely a Russian-dominated organization, which has relatively modest mandate to promote harmonization of policy in a few key areas. Um, those key areas include... Um, labor, uh, tariffs, technical regulations. But once again, the ambitions for this institution are far greater than the reality. Um, the second topic which was uh, of the paper, which looks at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, comes to similar conclusions, where this organization, which was nicknamed at its inception the League of Dictators, is fundamentally less capable and less successful at dealing with its uh, self uh, described goals of pursuing the three evils of extremism, terrorism, and um, uh, uh, separatism. But in reality, as a mechanism for actually dealing with violent extremism, for fighting the war on terror, um, it remains largely uh, an organization on paper rather than a capacity for, for solving problems. And once again, you see this Russian fixation on creating as big of a show of unity and surrounding Russia with these important global figures than an ability to create an institution that has capacity to solve real world problems. And it's not, I think, a coincidence that the SCO's summit meetings have taken on this kind of ever broader agenda. The agenda itself remains uh, I think unwieldy, and as it gets bigger and as the organization has grown bigger, the ability to forge consensus has been greatly reduced. So you have a lot of tensions between Russia and China. Russia kind of looks at a lot of issues through the security lens and tries to be the big brother on security in the region of the SCO. China, on the other hand, sort of wants to promote regional cooperation and economic development where it feels it has the, the competitive advantage. And then you have these internal rivalries between, for example, Uzbekistan and its neighbors or Kazakhstan Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan or India and Pakistan, where relations are just obviously incredibly complicated. And so the idea that an organization like this can reach consensus or tackle real world problems starts to break down. And then finally, and here I'll wrap up and turn things over to Philip. <clears throat> 
If you look at the BRICS, it's a similar story. This was an organization which was set up on the back of a kind of a marketing scheme from Goldman Sachs in the early 2000s with the idea that, you know, this part of the, these, these three countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, would dominate the global economy. Things have not totally worked out that way for three of the four BRIC countries. Um, then in 2009, I believe, South Africa was, act, uh, was added to the, the, the constituents of the group in a way that also doesn't really make a lot of sense based on where South Africa's economic and social indicators are. Um, and you see an organization which has tried to migrate away from managing issues related to the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, to a kind of set of broad global goals of technology and a, you know, sort of host of issues, and the capacity is simply not there. So what do the Russians do? In 2009, after the war in Georgia, they make a big show of having a BRIC summit so that Putin can show that he's not isolated. In 2014, it's the same story after the war in Ukraine begins. So now, once again, these become fora for Russia to show and send a message, especially to Russian domestic public uh, audience, Russian domestic audiences, that Russia's not isolated and that Russia's a big player and it's setting some of the... the the, uh, the pace internationally when in fact major problems that these organizations all claim that they're going to be tackling are left unaddressed. So anyways, that's a sort of overview of the project. Very much look forward to the discussion and I'll turn things over to Philip Remler. Um, I was asked to write two papers for this project, the project that Andrew described, uh, one on uh, Russia and European security institutions such as the OSCE and the other on Russia and the UN. Uh, the first one was published by Carnegie, I believe, in August. The second one exists only in, in a preliminary draft. Um, and I was asked to, to present to you on those, and I'll do it in a very general way. Uh, the papers are meant to be interpretive and not to be you know, a, a detailed um, uh, description. Uh, they're complementary. Uh, they both stem from concepts of international law, it seems to me. Uh, Russia likes to separate international law, as, as you were saying, international law from the rules-based international order. Uh, to a certain extent, um, <clears throat> then uh, the UN embodies international law, especially in the Russian view, and the European security institutions, especially the OSCE, embody the rules-based order. Um, in speech after speech, uh, we see Putin and Lavrov declaring support for international law, and decrying what they call the rules-based order. They do not positively define either of them, though. Is that a problem? Oh. Um, implicitly, though, uh, while they don't positively identify, uh, define uh, these concepts, uh, implicitly Russia finds international law pretty much only in the UN, in the UN Charter and in the resolutions of the UN Security Council. In 2016, uh, Putin enlisted China in support of this view with a joint declaration on international law, which says pretty much that. If uh, we, on the other hand, wanted to define the rules-based order, uh, we'd look to the series of commitments undertaken by countries, including Russia, in support of democratic governance domestically and cooperative security internationally. These commitments began with the Helsinki Final Act, but also include the Charter of Paris and other documents that deal both with security and with commitments to democracy and human rights. <clears throat> now, democracy and human rights, well, autocrats since the end of World War II have always been uneasy with the fact that democracy is the most powerful source of legitimacy. <clears throat> if it weren't, we'd never have had such oxymorons as the German Democratic Republic and the Korean People's Democratic Republic. I mean, they didn't do this because they felt democratic. They did this because they, this would render them legitimate with their people. <laughs> Following on the Helsinki Final Act with its bas basket three focus on human rights, <clears throat> sorry, the Charter of Paris, which Russia signed, explicitly endorsed democratic governance. In denouncing the rules-based order as a vehicle for Western dominance, Russia has found a way to devalue those vital documents and what might be termed the OSCE Aki without explicitly re, uh, rejecting them. In other words, you, you just call it a Western-dominated thing and, and um, you don't say that you're going back on these particular documents. Another concept promoted by Putin and Lavrov is multipolarity, as Andrew described. 
uh, whose international reception gains legitimacy from uh, the delegitimation uh, that was uh, of unipolarity, you might say, that was unleashed by those who promoted a unipolar world in which democracy could be exported by force. At the UN, multipolarity is mostly expressed in a tacit alliance between Russia and China, who share an interest in limiting American influence. Multipolarity also allows the rejection of democratic values without actually saying you're rejecting those values. Instead, you are saying that you stand for a principle that, quote, peoples should choose the method of development that suits their cultures and civilizations. And that's a quote from a Lavrov speech. In, in Europe, multipolarity is expressed through the concept of the integration of integrations, which seeks parity between the Russian-centered regional bodies, which Andrew talked about, such as the Collective Security Treaty Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union on the one hand, and Western-centered organizations such as NATO and the EU on the other. Multipolarity in the Russian worldview leads to sovereignty. These, the concept flows into sovereignty. True sovereignty belongs only to a few large countries in the, germ in the, in the, in the Russian view. Uh, this is brought out most elegantly, I think, in the book by uh, Bobo Lowe, the Australian writer. Um, the rest of the countries have a sovereignty that is limited by the extent to which more powerful countries make choices for them. This organizes the world into camps as during the Cold War. It's clear that Russia is seeking to surround itself with a camp uh, by creating regional institutions with itself at the center, such as the ones that Andrew was talking about, CIS, CSTO, EAEU, etc. Remember that the Ukraine crisis was ignited by what Russia saw as poaching from its camp by the EU, the EU association agreements by Armenia and Ukraine initialed by Armenia and Ukraine. In response, as you may remember, President Putin summoned the presidents of those two countries separately to Moscow and induced them to renounce those agreements in favor of joining the new EAU. Popular re reaction led to the ouster of uh, Yanukovych in Ukraine in 2014 and indirectly also of the, the ouster of Armenian President Sarkisyan in 2018. Russia's dual, approach, dual track approach to sovereignty is on the one hand an abstract concept of the equal sovereignty of all states and on the other as a true sovereignty of world oligarchs distinguished from the limited so sovereignty of their vassals lends a somewhat schizophrenic character uh, to Russian interactions at the UN. Putting down threats to Russia's own sovereignty and territorial integrity by force is, quote, not only our right, but our duty, as Foreign Minister Kozarev put it in 1995 with regard to Chechen separatism. Russia has taken a similar approach to Serbian sovereignty in 1999 and to Syria's since then, uh, since the outbreak of the armed rebellion there. But Russia's approach to the sovereignty of post-Soviet states has been quite the opposite. The official Russian position is that separatist threats to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova, and now Ukraine put the sovereignty of the affected territories, quote, in dispute, and that it is impermissible to resolve these disputes by force. So the exact opposite of, of what, for, uh, what, he, what the Russians have said about other conflicts. These are live issues for both the UN, which established a monitoring mission for Abkhazia, and the OSCE, which has led mediation efforts in Karabakh, South Ossetia, and Transnistria. We made clear in the paper on Russia that, uh, in, in European security institutions, that one of the uses fi uh, Russia finds in its commitment to the OSCE, perhaps its principal use, is with regard to these protracted conflicts. The mediation efforts allow Russia both to support separatist rebels and to mediate as neutrals between those rebels and the metropolitan states. This was true as well for the Abkhazia conflict. Uh, Russia has followed this, that same playbook with regard to the Donbass, exact same playbook. However, the seizure and annexation of Crimea have made using that pro uh, playbook, playbook problematic, at least in the OSCE context. As you know, uh, in, in the wake of the 2008 Georgia War and the West's recognition of Kosovo independence, Russia recognized the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And then in the wake of the Crimea-Ukraine crisis, uh, Russia annexed both of them 
uh, in all but name, signing treaties with the two polities that subsumed most of their key governmental functions into the Russian government's homologous functions. Uh, flowing from sovereignty, again, is the concept of legitimacy, which is highlighted by Russia's involvement with Syria, including at the UN. Russia has vetoed any UNSC draft resolutions tending toward condemnation of Syria for war crimes, use of chemical or other prohibited weapons, or torture, or other human rights violations. In cases where Russia couldn't veto, as in the creation of the IIIM, the International Impartial and Independent Mechanism for Investigating War Crimes, uh, by the UNGA, by the General Assembly, not by the Security Council, Russia has tried to attack through other means such as the budget. Uh, Russia cites as justification for this support the legitimacy of the government of Bashar al-Assad without reference to its origins, governance, popular support, or human rights record. That is surely what uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov was talking about when he spoke to the UN G General Assembly in 2018 of the rights of peoples to choose that form of development which suits their, quote, national, cultural, and confessional identities. And, and that, uh, the irony in all this is, is quite clear. By that criterion, the only difference between the Assad regime and the so-called Islamic State is that the former is internationally recognized. Aside from that, the record of ISIS of rule by murder, torture, enslavement, and cultural genocide could easily be justified as well as suiting its national, cultural, and confessional identity. It's, uh, that kind of relativism uh, can sink into the absurd very, very quickly. Uh, to be sure, uh, much of Russia's Syria, Syria project has to do with the aspiration to show that it's once again a world power, that it has a camp of allied states, and that it can fill a vacuum left by U.S. disengagement. But the specific rhetoric Russia employs at the U.N. seems based on something else, the absolute legitimacy of governments, regardless of their record of governance, popular legitimacy, human rights record, methods of internal security or anything else that smacks of the imposition of external norms. And here we come upon that aspect of this interlocking web of principles that appears most to correspond to Russia's, and in particular to President Putin's, domestic concerns. The absolute legitimacy of regimes, the obligation of obedience to appointed authority, and what might be termed, uh, not literally, uh, the divine right of presidents for life. How then to deal with Russia coming out of this set of interlocking concepts. Because of their structures, the UN and OSCE have taken diverging paths. Russia is virtually isolated in the OSCE now, with only one of its allies, um, Armenia, coming to its defense on Crimea and Ukraine, and that only very spor sporadically. Um, earlier this year, I took part in a discussion in Vienna on a paper recommending new conventional arms control efforts with the Russians. Uh, this smacked of normalization to the Swedish and Canadian ambassadors who criticized it harshly and emotionally. And when you unleash strong emotions from the Swedes and the Canadians, stronger than from Americans and Russians, uh, you know you've got a problem. Russia cannot be isolated at the UN because it wields a Perm 5 veto in the Security Council. While Russia and the West work together on some unrelated issues, I mean the JCPOA on Iran during the Obama administration, for example, mostly there is just sterile lecturing. It's very difficult at this juncture for the US to take a credible role in debating Russia at either the UN or the OSCE, that's my view. Instead, Finland and others who share democratic and human rights values might better make the case to the nations of what used to be called the third world whose rulers are often autocratic while their populations demand democracy. So thank you very, very much. Hello. <clears throat> As a Russian, I'll try to, try to explain Russian understanding of multilateralism. And to start with, I think that one of the main problems Russia has with multilateralism is that it is impossible to accurately translate this word into Russian. There is no Russian concept of multilateralism. And when I'm editing Russian translations of Western texts about multilateralism, I always face a dilemma how to translate this word. Because either you go for just transliteration 
and use this Western concept, which tells very little to even to educated Russian audience, or you make a very context-dependent translation, which is understandable for Russian audience, but is not that multifaceted as the original English concept. And this gap in understanding, it exists not only when you reach out to wider audience, but also in foreign policy community in Russia. Around a month ago, I took part in a EU-Russia dialogue on multilateralism in Moscow, and it was striking to see that Europeans and Russians had not just different understanding of what is multilateralism, their understanding was the opposite. Uh, for Europeans, multilateralism implies sacrificing some of your privileges, some part of your sovereignty for common good. For Russian, it was the opposite, uh, that multilateralism reinforces Russian sovereignty, that multilateralism reinforces Russian privileges because multilateralism implies that all participants treat each, each other as equal, that uh, they uh, respect each other, and that they undertake to not to infringe on each other's sovereignty. And, at least, and this idea of equality and sovereignty is crucial for any successful multilateral format in Russian understanding. And unless this condition of respect and sovereignty, precondition of respect and sovereignty is met, Russia is ready to take part in multilateral action and to make some concessions, sacrifices, but not because some rules require that not under pressure, but purely out of goodwill uh, or out of mutual concessions. So this, understand, this Russian understanding of multilateralism clearly has very little in common with the Western concept of rule-based multilateralism. And when somebody starts talking with Russia on uh, rule-based multilateralism, uh, it immediately, for Russia, it immediately invokes the question, who is writing the rules? And uh, in case of rule-based world order, for Russia, the answer is obvious, that's the United States. So these rules are, if these rules are written by United States, they are predictably biased against Russia, so Russia sees nothing bad about undermining them. Uh, so for Russia, what like this Western concept of multilateralism, for Russia, it comprises two quite different formats of international interaction. One is what Philip calls great power oligarchy. And the second one is uh, institutionalized dominance. This rule-based multilateralism for Russia is institutionalized dominance. Russia likes both formats. It's eager to take part in it, but under certain conditions. Uh, Russia loves great power oligarchy, especially the United Nations Security Council, or also like Astana format with Turkey and Syria, or with Turkey and Iran to, for Syria settlement, or Normandy format with Germany and France for Ukraine settlement, or P5 plus 1 format for negotiations on the Iran nuclear deal. Russia loves that. Uh, Russia's approach to these formats are very transactional, but, but they're not disruptive. Russia is ready to take into account interests of other powers. It is ready to make concessions, to behave constructively in search of a compromise. Uh, but still, Russia, in this format, Russia likes them because it has a guarantee that nobody is able to impose its will on Russia. That Russia is making concessions out of, like sovereign concessions our voluntary concessions, made out of mutual respect and understanding, not because of rules or pressure. Uh, with, with the second part, with institutionalized dominance, Russian perf performance is far more problematic because uh, Russia indeed treats this rule-based multilateralism as institutionalized dominance. For example, why Russia do not like the European Union? Because Russia sees it as a instrument of dominance of America over Europe. So if it's an instrument of American dominance, it's nothing bad for Russia to undermine it. 
or we can take Eurasian, Eurasian Economic Union, why it faces so many difficulties in, in its development, despite being Putin's pet project. Precisely because Russia, Russia used it to dominate, not as a rule-based organization, but as a dominating organization uh, which enables Russia to dominate post-Soviet space. It's Russia who is writing the rules in Eurasian Economic Union, so Russia feels entitled to ignore these rules, to manipulate them, to fail to deliver on its promises, and so on. Like countries like Belarus or Kazakhstan, 10 years ago, were lured uh, to the, the customs union with Russia by Russian promises to create common market of oil, gas, electricity, but Russia failed to deliver on all these promises and didn't bother to explain its partners why. Just a few months ago, a common electricity market was supposed to be created between Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan and other members of the Eurasian Union. It didn't materialize, and Russia didn't bother to explain why. And why to bother when Russia is strong enough to impose its will on all other members of the Eurasian Economic Union? And Russia is very keen to preserve this dominance from, from, first in, uh, from any competition from other members. For example, when Kazakh President Nazarbayev proposed including Turkey into the Eurasian Union, Russian reaction was very negative because Russia wants to keep the situation the way when it, when it is stronger than all other members taken together. So I wouldn't say that Russia is a purely disruptive power which hates multilateralism and uh, dreams only about undermining it. It's just Russian understanding of multilateralism is much more narrow. It's either great power oligarchy where nobody can impose its will on Russia, or it's some regional dominance where Russia can impose its will on others. So that's all. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, interesting presentations. I tried to comment on and, and around them with the time that I have been given. I think the, the starting point could be the words of a Italian revolutionary thinker and actor from the 19th century, Giuseppe Mazzini. I mean, he wrote the words, great things are, achi are achieved by gauging the, re the direction of one century. So understanding and, 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 and anticipating the sense of direction of, of, of the flow of history, so to speak, and, and, and great things will follow from there. And I think when we talk about Russia and multipolarity and its role in, 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 in the, in the, in the uh, global scheme of things, it, it, it seems as if they have got it right, at least for the time being. Uh, when we look at the world today and the direction of this century, it seems to be multipolarity and great power competition or concert. Uh, um, working together at times and competing quite often. But I'm not so sure if this is the whole story. And I think the key question that we need to think about when talking about Russia and multilateralism and the future of global order is really is that, uh, do they have a crystal ball? Since Primakov doctrine in 1997, do they have a crystal ball where they have sensed the direction of history or are they rather a clock that has stopped? but shows the time correctly uh, two times in, in, in the circle of 24 hours. And, and I think the jury is still out there. I mean, I think there's a lot of um, room to argue that actually this could be a phase and, and, and that the underlying larger forces of history actually will show that this current way of framing our international global space as some kind of a sphere of competition and, and great power competition and concert is actually the wrong way to go about things. And we eventually, one way or another, need to embrace the essential interdependence and, and, and look for ways to work together on, a, on, a, on an entirely different and a much more ambitious footing. But the problem for us standing here today is that we are not there yet and we have to live in the present, and, and, and I think in this respect, the words of Mazzini again, the continuation of this quote actually goes, the words, the secret of power lies in will. And I think this is also a fact that shows uh, 
how uh, Russia is operating currently in the world today. Nothing is preordained in their view, and Russia is working very hard to create facts on the ground and, and in, a, in, a, in a sense push uh, global, the global political space and, and especially European political space in a certain direction that would be more conducive to their understanding of international politics and more conducive to the realization of their interest. And in this respect, it's interesting to know that Russia is very active and it engages globally. And, and in this respect, the moniker of the return of global Russia is probably apt. And, and I agree with the sort of the main sentiment of the presentations and perhaps would go even a step further and argue that Russia is not isolated. We have tried very hard in the transatlantic community to convey this impression, but I think Russia has been able to work around this fact quite effectively. Uh, and including engaging um, uh, the West in the process more on the bilateral level, which is, which is also a factor of, of stability and a good thing to a certain degree, most obviously as well. But the interesting story is the increasing footprint of Russia in the world today. And, 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 and one thing, the, the sort of the space to watch that is often overlooked when we talk about these summits and see that as the sort of the sign of Russia's international cloud and footprint is the amazing, breathtaking pace with which both Putin and Medvedev actually are engaging international partners. I mean, if you look at the amount of trips uh, that Medvedev in particular is doing, the amount of outreach on the part of Russia is actually quite something. And they are really working the scene very hard to, to, to create partnerships, to establish links, and, 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 and to show that they are actually a, a force to be reckoned with on the global level. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be very honest and brutal even. Uh, it's very hard to pinpoint any amazing successes. And more importantly, if we think about Russia as a great power, uh, some kind of in, the, in, 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 in some kind of a uh, leading troika of, 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 of the world of tomorrow, it's very hard to pinpoint any actual successes and more importantly, any solutions that Russia would have offered to any important international issue or process uh, as such. And I think this is a clearly a shortcoming in the Russian approach at the moment, that it doesn't offer solutions necessarily. Uh, it doesn't offer ideas how to take things forward. But it offers a story of, of essential stability, the story of the possibility of somehow turning back the time and, 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 and resetting some of the political processes that have transpired in the world for the past two or three decades. But that said, and I think this is very important, uh, many are rooting for Russia in the world today. And, uh, and, and in a way, the role of Russia in the world today is that they are giving the finger to the West uh, very explicitly. And in the process, they send a signal of certain possibility of emancipation to many. And I think this is a message that is a appreciated and liked by many in the world today. And this is also a political fact that we need to take into consideration. And I remember back in the 2014 when I was working as a policy planner at the, at the MFA and I remember the hectic activity within the Western community and the European Union included to somehow galvanize a broad-based uh, support or rather broad-based condemnation to Russian activities in Crimea and, 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 and Eastern Ukraine. And that was done, of course, for all the right reasons. But I, I remember that it wasn't amazingly successful. I mean, there was a lot of empty seats, a lot of voices that were not, and votes that were not cast in, 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 in support of the, of the Western policy line at the time. And this is probably something that we don't fully appreciate when we look at how Russia operates and, and most importantly how Russia argues about world politics, is that Russia is less and less talking to us, although it is still talking with us. And this is perhaps an important uh, distinction to keep in mind. Increasingly the audience is elsewhere, even though the interlocutor might be sitting uh, face to face or next to us.
And it seems to me at times that the more outrageous the message is, the better. So, for example, the FT interview that Putin gave, um, how liberalism is obsolete or has outlived its purpose. Uh, it was done on purpose, uh, perhaps to offend uh, the editors of Financial Times and, and the good readers in the West, but most importantly to signal to the rest of the world that, guys, this is how it's going to be and this is, this is the sort of the stage that we are operating on. Uh, so to conclude these short remarks, I think it's obvious to, at least to me, that Russia has become the prodder in chief and the cheerleader in chief for the changing world order. And it's the busy rewinding or turning the, back the clock in, to a certain extent. But whether it will be the main beneficiary of these developments most definitely remains to be seen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I must say that I enjoyed the uh, remarks of the uh, previous speakers and in fact I uh, agree with the observations made by the four gentlemen. Uh, I only would like to add a small footnote and regret the yet, yet another all-male panel in, on this uh, important issue. Um, my point of view uh, to the uh, topic uh, is that of a practitioner, and I offer some comments from that vantage point. I have uh, experience with Russian and before that Soviet multilateral diplomacy since early 80s when I served in the Finnish UN missions in, in Geneva in New York, and I uh, cannot resist uh, telling an anecdote from my time in New York, where, where I was working in the second committee of the UN General Assembly, and uh, I had a, one Soviet colleague who was an easygoing Soviet chain smoker called Sergei Lavrov. Our paths took different directions after that. Uh, so um, the big picture um, painted by the previous speakers is something I, I very much agree, and I don't contest it. Uh, to start with my comments, I, I would uh, start with the one that established multilateral institutions like, like uh, UN and, and OSCE continue to be important fora for the Russian Federation. And at the same time, however, Russia has become more active in some new formations, such as Shanghai Cooperation Organization or BRICS where it can find more support and, and less critics. Today, uh, Russia asserts herself very strongly in multilateral institutions. This development has become more visible during recent years, but, but not as uh, visible, I would say, as, as the ascent of China, which, however, has been different by nature. In particular, the stance of these two, two states towards a rules-based order is divergent, on the surface at least. In my understanding, Russia sees uh, multilateral institutions useful for its status and goals, although it's not committing itself to some basic universal rules, but rather seems to omit or weaken them and at least use them selectively. <clears throat> I agree with an observation made by Maxine David from, from Carnegie Moscow that for us a multilater multilateralism is more strategy than normative principle based on values. And I think Maxine also made that abundantly clear. It is often argued and uh, I would say convincingly that Russia, Russia is generally punching above its weight. <laughs> now in many international institutions institution, in particular in the UN Security Council and the OSCE. The decision rules which were made and designed before or during the Cold War, in fact, they give Russia means to continue to punch above its weight. Now, what is uh, Russia's uh, basic posture in multilateral institutions? Is it defensive or offensive? 
I'm inclined to think that Russia's multilateral behavior reflects Russia's, Russian state's defensive strategy. It aims to fight off what it seems as efforts to limit its activities and defends what is left of Russia's great power status, which of course very much uh, rests on, on its permanent membership in the Security Council. Simultaneously, Russia wishes to increase it, its influence close to its borders and globally. It tries to strengthen its status also in international organizations and institutions. The way Russia tries to reach its aims looks often quite aggressive and disruptive. Russia is also thin-skinned and allergic to outside critics, which of course makes it similar to any, any great power. Russian style has become indeed more confrontational in multi multilateral contexts, but not on all fronts. There are some common challenges like terrorism or the JCPOA, where more cooperative approach by all key players, including Russia, remains. Regarding new domains such as information arena, cyberspace and outer space, Russia advances its own ideas of governing them, as, as the example told by Mika Altula made clear. Now, there seem to be some permanent and recurring principles which guide Russia's approach in the multilateral contexts. One quite conspicuous is invoking state sovereignty instead of universal rules. Emphasis on state sovereignty has been on the rise in the vocabulary of many nationalist leaders, and Russia has been, quite, has been and is quite vocal in this group. In line with the emphasis on state sovereignty is Russia's tendency to keep the secretariats of the UN and other organizations on a short lease. Russia doesn't want secretariats to step in any way on the, on the territory it sees uh, only for the member states. Russia also refers regularly to international law, as we heard, when it serves its purpose. When Russia is accused of breaking international law in cases such as the annexation of Crimea, Russian diplomats often recourse to another tactics. What about this? Along the lines, what about the behavior of the West regarding Kosovo or Gaddafi's Libya? At more tactical level, Russian delegations often come to meetings with a wide array of objectives which sow confusion among other delegations. And it's, of course, quite time consuming for other delegations to find out which are the real objectives of the Russia and which, are, which ones are only used for delay and mixing up negotiations. Russian delegations do not shy away from coupling totally detached issues, conditioning progress in one issue to progress in another. Now, uh, when you add a well-resourced foreign service with well-educated and well-trained skillful diplomats to these approaches and tactics, in Russia you have a really demanding and robust player in multilateral fora. I, I don't have any recommendations how to deal with today's Russia and its, its uh, <clears throat> style, but maybe a final practical comment, uh, and that is that if you have to wrestle arm with your Russian colleagues, you would better do your homework and uh, check the negotiating history of the issue at hand. You can count on that your Russian colleague has done just that. Thank you. <laughs>